All right, so now we want to focus on the dark reactions of photosynthesis. So this is kind of the reverse of the Krebs cycle where you're breaking down our pyruvate that came from glucose. And instead, we're going to build up a molecule of glucose and create the sugar from the energy that was generated in those light reactions. So just like we saw in the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, these two cycles are going to be connected with each other. So in the light reactions, we saw the utilization of water. We're taking the electrons in this case from the water molecules. We're releasing oxygen as the byproduct. The electrons get transferred to molecules of NADPH. And we also are generating ATP. So this is very similar to the electron transport chain, right? But here, the energy that's being utilized to create the ATP is not coming from food molecules. Instead, it's coming from the energy of the sun. The ATP and the NADPH, the electrons, are used to reduce carbon dioxide and uh, remake the carbohydrates or glucose molecules. And the enzymes that are involved in this reaction are known as the Calvin cycle. So the Calvin cycle consists of three major phases. Phase one is the carbon fixation phase. Essentially, carbon dioxide is going to be fixed or bonded to an organic molecule called ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, making it one carbon larger, converting it from a five carbon compound into a six carbon compound. This is then going to spontaneously break apart into two three carbon units. These units are both three phosphoglycerate units. And then in phase two, you have the reduction going on. So you can see the utilization of the electrons from NADPH joining into the molecule that will then become our sugar molecule, glucose. Phase three are the enzymatic steps that need to regenerate ribulose 5-phosphate. This would be similar to our oxaloacetate in the Krebs cycle. That's kind of the starting material that we go in from. Right, so for our carbon fixation step. And that way, once you regenerate the ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, you can repeat the cycle. So just looking at our carbon numbers, you can see that phase one is our carbon fixation. And to create one molecule of glucose, we're going to need to incorporate six carbon dioxide into six molecules of the ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate to create a single glucose molecule, right? So all of the carbons that are going into generating our glucose are coming from carbon dioxide. So the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase, or more commonly known as Rubisco. And we'll talk more about the details of the enzymatic activity of this step. We then generate molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate, and this is from the spontaneous decomposition of that 6-carbon molecule that's generated during the carboxylation event. So if you divide 6 of these in half, you'll end up getting 12 3-carbon units. So the phosphoglycerate is reduced to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So in this process, you need 12 molecules of NADPH to do the reductions, and you also need 12 ATP molecules to mediate these reactions because you need to generate a bisphosphorylated intermediate in this pathway. So this is very energy intensive to make the sugar molecules. So once you make the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, two of these are used to form the glucose phosphate, and then the phosphate can be cleaved off to just have glucose. So all of these six carbon dioxides that came in are essentially accounted for in the one glucose molecule that's coming off of this process. So the remaining 10 glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates are rearranged to form six ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate molecules. And this requires six ATP molecules as well. So you can see 18 ATP molecules, 
12 NADPH molecules to generate a single molecule of glucose. So it's nice that plants have that energy from the sunlight to be able to create the glucose molecules. So that first phase then is the carbon fixation phase, and this uses the Rubisco enzyme, which takes the ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate and combines it with the carbon dioxide to make this unstable six carbon intermediate. This is almost immediately decaying uh, with the addition of water into two molecules of three phosphoglycerate. And to make that one glucose molecule, you're going to need this to happen six times, right? So you'll get incorporation of six carbon dioxides into six molecules of ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate. These all then would break in half and make 12 molecules of the three phosphoglycerate. So for keeping track of how many are required to make one molecule of glucose, you need to have 12 of these present. So let's talk a little bit about the, the Rubisco enzyme. Ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase, or also oxygenase, we're going to see it has a side reaction that is pretty reactive for this enzyme, but it's a side reaction that you really don't want to have happening, or the plant won't want to have happening. This enzyme consists of eight large subunits and eight small subunits. And each large subunit contains a catalytic and a regulatory site. The small subunits enhance the activity of the large subunits. So this uh, enzyme is extremely abundant. It accounts for over 30% of the total leaf protein in some plants and is likely one of the most abundant proteins in the biosphere. And why is this? Because this enzyme is a terrible enzyme catalytically. So you need to have a large amount of it around to be able to convert enough of the carbon dioxide or trap enough of the carbon dioxide onto the ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate to be efficient enough to make glucose molecules. So it has a really, really slow turnover rate of only about three products per second, right? That is probably the worst enzyme like ever known. The fastest enzymes can convert a million products in per second. So this one is really, really a terrible enzyme. So fixing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, not an easy job, but it's fantastic that this enzyme can actually do that. So this slide shows the activity of the active site of the Rubisco enzyme. And you can see a molecule of magnesium is required. So the magnesium is stabilized by interactions with glutamate and aspartate residues that are holding it into the binding pocket of the Rubisco site. And you can see that there also is a lysine residue that's stabilizing this magnesium and it actually has been carboxylated as well. So there's a carboxyl group that has been added onto this lysine and it's helping to stabilize the magnesium. So here our ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate in blue is going to be able to come into this active site and interact with this metal cofactor. So it's holding it in position. And so once it's docked with the magnesium, it's going to form an enol intermediate and so you, you can see the double bond shifts in between the two carbons from the carbonyl position in this first place here. And this allows an anion to form on the oxygen, right? So um, the carbon dioxide then that's going to be fixed from the atmosphere can come into the binding pocket at that point. And it's stabilized also by this magnesium. And it bumps out that water molecule that's sitting up here. So this is still in the enolized state. You still have that, you still have that enol formation. So then we're gonna come down here where you have the formation of that unstable intermediate. And so this happens when that double bond from the ene is going to attack the carbon dioxide and you're going to form the link with that carbon dioxide, fixing that carbon dioxide, forming this new carbon-carbon bond. This also leads to the reformation of the carbonyl group. 
And once this carbon dioxide gets fixed to this molecule, this is where it becomes very unstable. A molecule of water is going to come in here and attack that carbon position. You can see you're adding the OH to one side and you're adding the hydrogen up here um, to the oxygen that used to be that carbonyl oxygen. Right, so you're doing, you're adding water across that double bond. And this forms this very unstable intermediate after you have that hydration. And this leads to the cleavage of the product into two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. So that's the biological activity that happens at the Rubisco enzyme. And you can see that by the time that the product is actually even released from the active site, it's already the 3-phosphoglycerate. So this intermediate really does not hang around very long. So when light is present, the light reactions in the thylakoid pump protons from the stroma into the thylakoid. So you learn that is going to generate the energy so that you can make ATP, very similar to what we saw in the electron transport chain. Well, doing this will also increase the pH inside the stroma, right? Because if you're pumping protons out of the stroma and into the thylakoid space, right, you're removing acidity from the stroma. And so the pH is going to go up and become more basic. So it goes up to about pH of eight while the pH that's in the thylakoid is going to drop to about pH 6. So you've got a differential of pH inside the thylakoid space and the stromal space. This increase in the pH of the stroma causes the release of magnesium from the thylakoid lumen. Well, we just said magnesium is the cofactor for the Rubisco enzyme. So it will increase the efficiency of the dark reactions when you have sunlight present and you're pumping protons into the thylakoid space. So this helps to couple the Calvin cycle with the light reactions that are going on so that you have more activity of the Calvin cycle when light is present and photosynthesis is active. So essentially, while the Calvin cycle can occur in the dark, it is not dependent on light, right, for those chemical reactions. It's still more efficient when you have the light reactions are actively taking place to produce that ATP and NADPH, as well as promoting the translocation of magnesium ions into the stroma. So these two are also connected by these energy resources, right? They're being utilized in the Calvin cycle. So if you're not having the light reactions active, you're going to slow the production of ATP and NADPH, and eventually the Calvin cycle won't be able to run. So of note, the Rubisco enzyme, we said it could either be a carboxylase or it can be an oxygenase. And so that oxygenase, reactivity is a side reaction. And in addition then to producing um, two molecules of the 3-phosphoglycerate, when carbon dioxide gets fixed, Rubisco can also accept oxygen in the same type of reaction. It will also interact with the ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, but instead of forming two molecules of the 3-phosphoglycerate, it can only form one molecule of that and one molecule of 2-phosphoglycolate. So this product can no longer be utilized in creating sugar or recovering enough of the ribulose 2,5-bisphosphate that's needed to recover the starting material to keep the Calvin cycle going. So it makes this enzyme really, really, really less efficient. And it's amazing that this side reaction is actually really prevalent. So approximately 25% of the reactions mediated by the Rubisco enzyme are the oxygenase pathway. So this really reduces efficiency of sugar production by about 25% in what we call C3 plants. Um, and C3 plants are just the plants that have the um, Calvin cycle as the main pathway of producing sugar molecules. We'll see some other plant types as well that have some other adaptations to being able to conserve uh, carbon dioxide and also sequester oxygen away from the Rubisco enzyme. 
So you want to definitely keep pores open while you're doing photosynthesis so that that byproduct, that oxygen that gets produced in the light reactions can go away. You want it to be expelled into the atmosphere, not held in the cell where it can interact with the Rubisco enzyme. So why would this happen? <laughs> why do you have this crazy side reaction? Um, I think it is just because oxygen is also very nonpolar molecule. It looks about the same size as carbon dioxide and it fits into the enzyme and has um, reactivity. And it's present there as a side product from the light reaction. So there's actually quite a lot of O2 that is around. So that 2-phosphoglycolate can get reconverted to the 3-phosphoglycerate, but it is an incredibly painful process to do this. So if you have the oxygenase activity, you produce this one molecule here, you produce this one molecule here. This is in the chloroplast of the cell, right? So to recover the 3-phosphoglycerate, this 2-phosphoglycolate has to leave the chloroplast. It has to go into the peroxisome where stuff happens to it. It gets converted into different product. It leaves the peroxisome, goes on into the mitochondrion. More enzymatic reactions are going to occur to recover the 3-phosphoglycerate. Goes back through the peroxisome to finish that process, and then it has to get transported back into the chloroplast. So this is quite a process to try to recover this, and it just is not efficient to be able to generate sugar molecules and recover the ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate needed to run the Calvin cycle. 